So we get into, and today we're going to kind of look at sort of the business uh, overview and the structure of business and, you know, the definition of uh, mission statement, vision statement, core values of why a business uh, is uh, functioning in operation. Typically, uh, today I might have a little bit more uh, uh, dialogue than I normally do. Usually you'll see in the other classes once we get into it, I'll have the dialogue, but I'll also have more discussion. All right, so uh, bear with me a little bit today, and we do have discussion today, but it's more towards after the break sort of thing. Uh, but uh, usually you'll have plenty of time to uh, interact and discuss without hopefully falling asleep. Okay, so uh, basically uh, HR, uh, what factors are key to organizational success or failure? Well, human resources are at the heart of uh, that success or failure. It's, you know, it's the, it's the people, it's the culture, uh, and, you know, you can have the best uh, plan in the world, but if the people implementing the plan don't buy into the plan or are not capable of, uh, you know, implementing the plan, uh, then you're going to not meet with success. It's, it's pretty simple in that, that respect. And so it, it really goes down to the foundations of uh, business and the people that are working within the business, the hiring process that they've gone through. Uh, you know, I have a little graphic, those of you that have already printed off the slides, but that graphic comes towards the end of the, the class. But really, you kind of get into uh, this uh, overview of how a business is, is run. And basically, a business will develop a mission. Uh, and some businesses, some businesses will do it more very, very clearly cut out. This is the mission. This is the vision. Uh, of the business and everybody in that business knows it. Other businesses, it's not so easy to find. Uh, but it, in some cases, it may not be as firmly written down and entrenched, but the people in the business are operating under certain values and it, that has been adopted whether they really realize it or not. And other businesses, it's kind of like our, our, our truck, it's kind of ad hoc, you know, the green sort of thing. So it's not that clear and uh, it's not that well understood within the business. And sometimes uh, businesses uh, can run a little bit uh, amok when they really don't know uh, their purpose. Sometimes the business is so small, it's pretty easy sort of to have that understanding within the business and the business grows. And so how do you manage that growth? That, that becomes uh, a, an issue too. Some very, very small businesses are quite successful when they're small, but when they expand, they run into a lot of difficulties and then they wonder why. Well, there's some changes that have to take place in how you operate the business, and there's some systems and indeed some controls that need to be put into place. And we'll talk about controls too. You know, the controls can be somewhat good and somewhat bad. And so we'll, we'll, we'll talk a lot about that throughout the course as well, about getting the right uh, level of uh, control and uh, uh, mechanisms in place that fits the culture of that particular business. So basically, uh, organizes the mission, plans how to fulfill the mission, deploys the resources to implement the plan, meaning that you're delegating, you're assigning, you're making sure that you have resources that's able to implement the plan, making sure that people understand what the plan is and the different mechanisms for motivation. Uh, motivational force is something that we'll talk about in the course too. Uh, how, how can people be motivated over a long-term basis? The results, and I'm seeing a lot of cards here that say PROCEP. So I'm uh, understanding that some of you took the planning uh, project management course with Keith? Okay, so. Um, from that point of view, too, uh, assess the results. This is not much different than, from a project management point of view, monitoring and control, all right? Monitoring and control of a project, except on a business, it's at a more of a macro level uh, than a micro level project-based, okay? So uh, same sort of thought process that, that goes into that. And from a business you want a, a perspective, you want to see how your overall strategy is doing. And you're obviously going to monitor that, and then you're going to see, well, it's doing not so good. We have to make some adjustments. Or it's doing very good. Maybe we can set the bar a little higher because we're doing so well. Uh, so uh, you have to have those mechanisms to quantify uh, the information, also to uh, interpret uh, qualitative information that's not quite so quantifiable. I usually find when I'm 
in a room full of engineering stu students, everybody wants to quantify, quantify, quantify everything. Uh, but there's also a very, when we're dealing with people, there's a lot of qualitative uh, information that we need to take in as well. And of course, if there's any gaps, uh, then basically we, results, we want to identify those and uh, look at changing them. We'll also uh, discuss, well, sometimes you develop a strategy, uh, but something has changed so much in the external environment that the strategy no longer makes sense. Uh, and you might have to redevelop uh, the strategy based on that. You know, you might have had a strategy uh, uh, to um, sell so many cars and, you know, your GM or something, and then 2008 comes along, whatever that strategy was for the number of cars, that drastically changes because of, of external events that, that have occurred. So you want to be able to respond and react to those types of things when they do happen. So we take a little bit closer look at uh, uh, the mission statement. Basically, uh, it's really sort of, the mission statement is really looking at uh, the business's purpose, all right? The business's purpose of existence. What business are you in? What's its purpose now? So think of a mission statement as being much more present, in the present oriented. What's the purpose of the business? What business are you in now? Uh, it should uh, consider the stakeholders that are involved in the business and the external environment. There's no sort of mission statement police out there. You know, there's no mission statement police that says this is exactly how it should read, but it should be very present uh, oriented. It should be that people uh, that read it uh, feel that they understand what business you're in and basically um, without a lot of detail, it's given at a higher level. Uh, have that understanding from the stakeholders, being your employees, being people outside the firm, uh, basically what you're trying to present. So probably uh, not bad, you can sort of, you can go online, there's actually a, a website called missionstatements.com, but there's all kinds of places that you can source mission statements. You can generally go to some businesses, their web page, and you say about us, and they'll tell you what their mission statement is. Some businesses don't believe in a mission statement, and I'll talk about that a little bit later uh, as well, um, because they feel that, well, this is our core business, but we're, we're, we're changing and evolving so quickly, we don't want to really sort of pigeonhole ourselves. We'd rather focus in on uh, our vision or our core values, and we'll talk about that as well. Uh, so mission statement, to exceed our customers' expectations in quality, delivery, and cost through continuous improvement and in customer interaction. You have to look at the business that it's coming from, uh, so basically, obviously, this would be reflective of those industries that uh, this particular example is in. And so really, that's just a very present uh, oriented and uh, really a focus telling anybody that's working for the business or anybody outside the business that uh, whatever the customer's expectations are, you're trying to exceed them. Now, some businesses, they'll have a mission statement and it looks all nice on a web page and nobody ever reads it, nobody ever pays attention to it, and it doesn't really do that much. Other businesses, as I said, they, if, they, if they do it, they kind of make that sort of uh, the modus operandi that uh, the business is following and uh, that they're trying to align themselves with. And that becomes important in many cases when you're talking about a very big business. How does the different departments uh, keep in sync with the overall uh, strategy of the business. Because sometimes departments can go way off into right field and left field. Sometimes they can go off into right field and meet with success. Uh, sometimes they can go off in the right field and cause disaster. So uh, that has to be considered as well. Now if innovation was in that particular uh, uh, statement, that would be telling you something different, right? It would be telling you that a big part of this business is that they're trying to innovate uh, new technologies and that's sort of a driving force and that would probably mean that there would have to be a lot of elements of research and creativity that would be developed lower down within the business. Probably something that everybody can identify with, uh, Coca-Cola. Uh, Coca-Cola company exists to benefit and refresh everyone it touches. The basic proposition of our business is simple, solid and timeless. When we bring refreshment, value, joy and fun to our stakeholders then we successfully nurture and protect our brands. And so they're really trying to identify with the stakeholders, all right? Uh, then we uh, 
particularly Coca-Cola. That is the key to the fulfilling our ultimate obligation to provide consistently attractive returns to the owners of our business. So this is just, that's just the mission statement, which is very sort of, as I said, looking at it uh, from a what business you're in today and how you're identifying with uh, your stakeholders. The next statement that you'll see is a vision statement, and it differs from a mission statement, and the mission statement is very present oriented. A vision statement's looking forward, it's looking out three to five years, all right? It can be a, whatever the term may be, but you know, usually three to five year periods, vision statement. Uh, and it really should clearly, succinctly describe uh, basically where the business intends to be in the future. It's not giving details, but it's saying where the business wants to be in the future. Uh, so, you know, uh, some of the elements of a strategic business is that um, it has these sort of elements that it addresses or it, it should be addressing. And basically, it charts a path for the future. You know, where are we going? Steers energies of employees in a common direction. Molds organizational identity. Is distinctive and specific to a particular organization. Uh, so in other words, you shouldn't be just copying it from other web pages. It should be something that makes sense for your organization. You can get ideas, you know, looking at other missions and visions, but it's just got to be specific for your business. Avoids use of generic language. Uh, triggers strong emotions. Is challenging, uh, uncomfortable, reaching, uh, meaning that it's not, it's not a piece of cake. It's not, it's not a, a done deal. So I'll give you an example, well, I can go, I'll give you first of all the sort of the Coca-Cola one. And Coca-Cola has sort of broken it down into a number of areas. Uh, basically, they've got to achieve sustainable growth, we have established a vision with clear goals. Maximizing return to shareholders while being mindful of overall responsibilities. They've got a couple here that they're trying to be socially responsible with, all right? Uh, meaning that uh, basically they want to, maximize the return to shareholders, but they don't want to, uh, you know, endanger the environment, uh, abuse, abuse people in other countries, etc. to do it. Uh, that's where that, that statement is coming in. And if they're making that statement, then it's very important that they actually do it. It's not that they just say it and then they don't do it, because that's, that really tends to come back to haunt businesses. Uh, if they don't. And I'll give you an example in a few minutes uh, when we talk about core values of, you know, how that, how that really can sort of embed itself in the psyche of an organization. Uh, people being a great place to work where people are inspired to be the best they can be. So when you start reading these ones, when you're developing then the uh, business strategy of how you're going to meet this vision, these should be kept in mind. That means that one of the areas that, you know, be a great place to work where people are inspired, that would mean that you would want to be looking at your employees and determining what uh, satisfaction rates you have with those employees, what kind of retention rates, how are you viewed from the outside world when you're recruiting people, you know, is this a, is this a place that people would love to work? and that you get a lot of applications because you have a very high reputation for not just, you know, making money, but for satisfaction rates uh, with your employees. Why do you think it is, you notice uh, when you read, you know, different magazines, there's the 100 top employers of the GTA, there's the 100 top employers in Canada, Canadian Business uh, puts that out. Why as an employer would I be, you know, pushing to be one of the top 100 employers? you're going to attract the best people. You attract the best people, you're going to be more successful. You're more successful, that's going to tie into other elements. But to be more successful and attract the best people, you have to be a great place to work where people are inspired to be the best they can be. It shouldn't be that they go into work and they feel tortured and they hate their job and they just want to do nine to five and get out. Uh, you've got to look at how can we inspire the best in people. I'm not saying Coca-Cola does it. I'm saying that they're proposing that they do that, right? You know, you have to look at each business as to how, how successful they are at aligning themselves with uh, what their vision is. And their vision might not even include that for some businesses, right? But, uh, so 
So a portfolio bringing to the world a portfolio of beverages brands that anticipate and satisfy people's desires. Obviously, that's an uh, important element because that's a core business element. Partners, nurturing a winning network of partners and building uh, mutual uh, loyalty. Uh, that's important. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, you're selling in I don't know how many hundred countries in the world. You're, you're uh, making your product in hundreds of different countries in the world. You have distribution channels. You have relationships with vendors, suppliers, and all of these other elements. Again, if, how are you uh, seeing? What kind of relationships do you have with them? Uh, I said I do a lot of work with uh, Alistan. I'll, I'll use them as an example. Uh, they basically have a, a, a logo that they have on basically their letterhead, on their coats, on their uh, uh, basically their logos and their signage, and it says, we build great relationships. We build great relationships. And they don't just say it, say it in the logo, their CEO is talking about it all the time. Uh, you know, a subcontractor bill of rights and uh, making sure that they're dealt with fairly. And, uh, and in construction, that's not always the easiest thing, believe you me. Uh, so uh, it's, it's how you organize yourself and how you promote that. And if you're going to promote it, how you follow up with that. So one of these line items, like being a great place to work, would mean there's got to be a whole plan behind that to make that a great place to work. That means that it probably involves making sure your employees are trained properly for the jobs they need to do, all right? So making sure that there's avenues and access to that training uh, that they're able to do. Uh, it would follow into motivational factors. Uh, what would motivate employees, which we'll look at later in the course. So what are the elements that would uh, motivate? And there's a lot of variables with that. It's not just a one sort of uh, cut deal with that. Uh, what would, uh, what kind of feedback mechanism are you going to incorporate so you know how you're doing? Are you getting better or are you getting worse compared this year to last year? Uh, so there's a number of uh, those kind of elements, even with uh, the partners, uh, nurturing a winner, winning network. Uh, you know, there's a lot that, that goes into that. Uh, Mattamy Homes that I did a lot of work with, they didn't like to call the subs subcontractors because it connotates being beneath. They preferred to say trade partner, all right, trade partner. And that, the aspect of trade partner is trying to say that we're in business and we're trying to make money on these projects. You're in business and you're trying to make money through projects with us. We can make this a win-win situation and how do we go about doing that? and taking a little bit more of a business-to-business uh, -business, uh, function to it and trying to ensure that both sides are coming out on a winning end as opposed to one side losing and one side winning and having an adversarial relationship, which causes a lot of disruption, uh, can lead to projects not being completed on time, over budget, etc. So there's, there's these elements that uh, play into uh, the vision and you know if you're going to set a vision it should be something that is uh, obtainable that the business is actually going to uh, push towards. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples again of uh, a mission and vision and I'm going to let you know you can uh, look at uh, different websites different businesses perhaps you've been involved in a business uh, that's a fairly large business that you can Maybe you never looked at it. Maybe you, you want to check out what their mission and vision is. Maybe you'll read it and you'll say, well, I never saw that when I was there. Uh, or maybe you'll say, okay, it wasn't really promoted, but it did seem that this was the way that things were flowing with this business. Um, so I would encourage you to do that. But just, again, another couple of examples. Uh, uh, as I said, I was involved with uh, Anatomy Holmes for a, a number of years, and they basically had uh, a mission, which was... Uh, the, the best homeowner experience, to provide the best homeowner experience. It, wasn't, it didn't say to build the best home. It didn't, you know, it didn't say to, uh, to build uh, communities. Some say that sort of thing. It said to provide the best homeowner experience. Because you could build the best home, but you purchased the house and be thoroughly ticked off with the process and never want to buy another new home again. All right? That's very possible. But they very clearly articulated the best homeowner experience. And, well, okay, well, how do I measure that? 
how do I, how do I measure the best homeowner experience? Well, there's different rating, third-party rating agencies that you can have. There's one called Avid Rating Service. There's J.D. Power, which could be in the automotive sector. It could be if you build chainsaw. That's where J.D. Power started, you know, chainsaws. It uh, could be in housing. And basically, there's a very thorough survey process that purchasers go through, all right? And at one point, uh, J.D. Power was publishing, you know, this in the newspaper. So basically... Uh, from, a, from a quality perspective, a homeowner purchaser perspective, who was number one, and they would publish it. And to be honest, um, the owner, uh, when they first published it, uh, they came second. And if you know the owner, that's Peter Gilgan, uh, you know, he's a philanthropist in Toronto, uh, Maple Leaf Gardens donated uh, millions of dollars for, the, for Ryerson University and the redevelopment of Maple Leaf Gardens, uh, sick kids and all that sort of stuff. He doesn't like to come second. He's like, what am I going to do? I'm going to go out there and tell Madame Holmes we're the second best in Toronto. Uh, that was not good enough for him. So as part of the business strategy, you know, in aligning with this uh, best homeowner experience mission statement, they had to then put in a strategy. Well, how do we go from number two to number one? All right, so for, to be honest, for that first year when they were number two, when J.D. Power first started rating businesses, they... Um, with their business, they came out and they said, we're in the top three. They didn't want to say they're only number two, we're in the top three. Uh, so they went through a process. And as I mentioned, I, I did a co-op with, I'd have uh, cohorts of students that would work for them over a summer and they'd have to fill out a journal of what happened every day. And I'm reading through these journals and I'm seeing these, and these are, they would, they would be looking for roles as uh, assistant site managers, all right? So these were the types of roles these students were uh, being moved into. And I would uh, be reading these journals and it, I would be reading along and it would say, stopped and changed tire for somebody. Stopped and changed tire. And you know, I got all these ones from different students, stopped and changed tire. And I go, so what's the deal with this stopped and changed tire? And like, well, when we first started, we were trained that if a client, if it seems like a purchaser comes onto the site, we have to do all of this process with them. You know, traditionally on a home building site or a construction site, uh, if, if a homeowner would come onto the site and they didn't have an appointment, they'd probably be sworn at and kicked off the site. Uh, their process was, we've got extra boots, we've got extra hard hats, we'll, you know, they want to see the house that's being built, somebody's got to take a few minutes and show them the house. You know, we're not going to promote that everywhere, but we're not going to kick them off the site. And you're on a site, what do you do? You run over a nail. You get a flat tire. So your first experience on the site to buy your new $700,000 home is that you're stuck on a site with a flat tire. That's just one of many, many mechanisms. They had to look at every touch point that a client has with, per with people within the company. And they had to train people within the company to have a certain reaction to the client. All right. Uh, so you, you understand where I'm coming from when we're talking about human resources and management and uh, that process. There, it's, a, it's a very complicated process, but if this is at the high level, you want the best homeowner experience, you're going to have to do a whole bunch of things if you really won't mean that. It doesn't just happen that you just sort of have a, a town hall meeting and say, everyone, we're going to have a, the best homeowner experience. See you later. It's got to be a lot of mechanisms. And not only that, they would bring in basically contractors from a quality control perspective and they would have quality walks with the contractors and they would uh, go through the process of inspection and we keep having this reoccurring problem. How can we look at that? How can we continuously improve upon that? We'll talk about that throughout the course too when we talk about continuous improvement, but we also have to tie that in with our human resources because it's the human resources that are going to have to implement, identify and make those improvements. So uh, that's an example of um, uh, the mission. That was just the mission. The vision was to be the best home building brand in North America. The best home building brand in North America. Well, if, you're, if you start out as a company that's the biggest builder in the GTA, there's no way you can be the best home building brand in North America and stay in the GTA. Can't, right? The market's only so big, you can get only so much of that market. If you want to be the best home building brand in North America, that means you have to spread yourself to other parts of Canada. 
but it didn't say best home building brand in Canada. It said the best home building brand in North America. It also means you have to expand into other markets in the US. And then that becomes part of your strategy. And then you build from that. All right. And that also involves hiring people in other locations, recruiting people in other locations. You got a culture in Toronto. Is the culture in, can you create the same culture in uh, the deep south of the US? Is there going to be variances and differences in that? And how do you go about that organizationally? Do you buy existing firms where you, there's already a culture that might be quite different than your own? Or do you develop from the ground up? These are questions that a business has to ask and uh, respond to and develop a plan and a strategy for how they're going to go about doing that. Not to mention the fact for those of, you know, a lot of you are very quantifiably uh, inclined uh, from an economics point of view, you've got every market, home building market in North America, which ones do you choose given your lim limited capabilities? Regardless, they had to do this because fundamentally, this is what this business is about. All right, so it's going back to, to preserve and improve human life. All right, and they felt that they had the wherewithal to be able to afford to do that. Uh, and they presented the case and uh, there's some stats on the web that I think it's between 18 and 20 million people have been treated with this uh, uh, cure of this uh, particular uh, disease. So, you know, they benefited millions of people. They really haven't made any money on it. It cost them millions of dollars. Uh, but uh, it was the right thing to do because the other thing that the CEO felt very strongly about, because word travels fast within an organization. I don't know if you noticed that or not, but when you're within an organization, when something negative happens, it can travel very, very fast. It's not something you can really keep the lid on especially when you've got researchers that think that they've found this uh, cure that's going to help millions of people and then if it's squashed or it's put basically in a vault somewhere and never and not looked at, um, that would be pretty demoralizing, I think. If you're a researcher and this is your passion and this is what you're, you know, and really most researchers when they get into this sort of field, they're really passionate and some of you I can sense too, you know, you're passionate about a specific specific area and you don't want it to just be thrown under the cover, especially when you've made the, you know, the, the first inkling of uh, a cure for something. So um, from that point of view and looking at sort of the core value and why people have worked for Merck in the past and gone to work for them, the CEO felt that that would be, you know, first of all, it wouldn't be dealing honestly with the employees from a moral perspective, from an ethical perspective, from an integrity perspective. Uh, it would have a, a, a very, very large negative impact. And more importantly, the CEO felt himself following uh, the uh, core values, it's the right thing to do. And so they did that. And it basically, the CEO, you know, will go on to say that, because you can Google this very easily. You start reading about Merck. If you were applying for a job at Merck, you would be finding this, you'd be falling all over this. Uh, it's helped them immensely in their recruitment, like to attract the best researchers or the people that really, you know, uh, are trying to do uh, good uh, in the world and probably the ones that will probably work 16 hour days and not get a lot of extra pay for it just because it's their passion. And they feel that that's in the end, given them a large competitive advantage. So that's an example of sort of understanding your core values and then making decisions based on your understanding of those core values. Uh, and it makes it easier for a business that way. And from a human resource perspective, uh, it means that you're in alignment with what the people that are working for you, what their purposes are. And they will feel an immense sense of pride in that, uh, you know, uh, and it will help to uh, motivate them when we talk about intrinsic motivations as opposed to extrinsic motivations uh, going forward. So that's, that's uh, uh, an example when we say core values. And so some businesses really sort of hang on to that uh, and develop that really thoroughly. And you may not find the mission statement or, or that even the vision statement that well public, uh, publicly published, but they really stick and revolve around those core values in decision making. Okay. And some businesses feel that the, the vision and that they may adjust and change, so they really focus on the core value 
And then in their business strategy, they still have, you know, what, what's our current purpose, what's our strategy, but it's not as well um, promoted to the day-to-day -day operations. So, uh, all the business have to have a mission, mission, and core value, or... Nope. Core value Some businesses don't have a mission or a vision. You talk to... Large businesses tend to, but small businesses, medium businesses, some don't. Uh, most don't, probably, small businesses. So, some small businesses, if you really uh, pick the brain of the owner, they have it crystallized. They just don't really know they have it crystallized. Uh, but as the business grows, it becomes more problematic to, if, I, if I'm an owner of a 10-employee operation, I can really espouse that pretty easy, easily to my 10 employees. If I'm the CEO of a 5,000 people operation, I can't espouse that. So it, it, it means that I've got to make sure that we've developed this so that my managers really are making decisions based on this. If I want to crystallize it and align it and have uh, a culture uh, that's going to provide the mechanism of growth that you're after. All right. And all, you know, I'm giving you some very sort of... Um, very sort of uh, well-identified examples. You know, sometimes they're, they, they, I gave you the example of uh, Mattamy, you know, best homeowner experience. Some companies, they don't care about, the, their mission's not the best homeowner experience. It might be, the, be to be the low-cost provider in their particular market. Here you go, boom, you know, like it, don't like it, whatever, we're on to the next project. And that's sort of the way that they operate. They will be more successful if everybody understands that's the way they operate who works for them, uh, then some people that don't, uh, uh, it depends on the business. And some of those businesses can be uh, successful as long as, they're, again, if they're treating their employees the right way, they know their, their business. Not everybody is an Apple, right? Not everybody is trying to be the most innovative. There's the ones that are trying to be the copiers, okay? So once they come up with something, we'll, we'll copy uh, what they have and we'll put it out to the markets and we'll do it at a lot less cost, because uh, we don't have to pay for all this innovation, uh, right? So, you know, the, you got to, for the particular business, it has to know itself and know its market. And know, not everybody can be an Apple. That's just, it's not going to work. Even Apple is going to have trouble being Apple, <laughs> being the innovator, right, when you're the leader of the pack. Uh, so there, there's those things to consider as well. Any questions on that? But after we get going, we get discussions and stuff, then people ask a lot more questions. First day, first hour, a lot, a lot less questions, I suppose. <laughs> any exa anybody have any examples of a business that they've worked for that had a mission that was pretty clearly articulated or a vision or core values? I'll give you one example that, you know, again, I don't want to... Uh, I have ones that are, uh, I very closely relate to because of some of the work I do, but um, consulting work I do. Uh, like I said, it's not bad to, uh, you know, you can check out some websites. This is, this is not bad, so see what I said? They always put, we build on great relationships. Uh, if you actually uh, go to this website and you check under uh, the company, this is the way we think, and it says rules should empower, not confine. Um, so basically, that's why we have to place a lot of trust in our people. So they're very much not into micromanaging this particular company. Uh, we know we can rely on them to perform their jobs to the best of their ability. They, in turn, trust us to groom them for success by offering them great opportunities and career advancement. Only then can we encourage independent thought and innovation. All right. Um, very much uh, into the uh, limiting of bureaucracy in this company, which is not easy when you're a big company. But they're very careful. They obviously have to have rules, but they're very careful about the rules. And the type of people that they have, they try to look for people that are very innovative in that sense, <coughs> more entrepreneurial uh, and maybe less uh, rules oriented. That's not for everybody, you know. That's not for everybody. Some people. Uh, like to have very clear, this is what I'm supposed to do. This is the outline, these are the rules, and this is what I operate in. And some people, they, they thrive better in that environment. Some people, they hate to be boxed in, and they like to have more freedom and flexibility. Uh, some construction companies, so Alistair is very much sort of towards that, innovative. I know PCL is much more 
rules oriented, has more of, and that's another big construction company. Uh, and it works very well for them and their culture. So it's not that one's right and one's wrong. You do have to hire the people that it better aligns with. So you want to look for that if that's what you're trying to align with. And so, you know, they bring into these uh, elements uh, that. And so on these key values, okay, so they're calling them key values, core values, uh, same thing, all right? So you can go to different uh, corporate websites and you can sort of get a sense of some, some elements. As I said, some companies really, really follow it closely. Others put it up there and nobody talks about it. So it depends on the business. But I can tell you some of the most successful businesses really fundamentally take that to heart. And if you read that uh, book, Good to Great, which I, again, tons of empirical evidence and studies and research that has gone through that, it, it comes to that conclusion as well. Uh, in this particular uh, case, uh, even on the, the homepage, um, the business, uh, this is the CEO, he's got a blog, you know, talk on the blog, talks and lots of blogs that you can read open to the public, uh, talks about, you know, business fundamentals, core values and that sort of thing. So you can see it in different, different uh, companies' websites when you visit them. You can, do a, you can get a good sense of things by checking things out. But you also have to understand, is this something that the business really follows or is this something more um, uh, that they're just putting up there for promotion, right? Okay. Well, I would look at a number of, a number of uh, elements. Um, you know, if they're saying fundamentally it's their, their people and this and that, I would try to, you know, if I was going for an interview or something and doing background research, I would want to find out what kind of internal training programs they have for their people, what kind of upgrading, how do they support their people in, in that way. I would want to be looking at, if it's a larger business, there's a good chance then, uh, are they one of the 100 best companies? Uh, what kind of background uh, can you find about that? Uh, if you can interview some employees, uh, basically, and there's so many different ways that you can find out information these ways, through LinkedIn, through uh, other avenues and social media and things like that, uh, to see if what they say uh, aligns with uh, what's out there, all right? That's the thing with today, the information is, you have, the thing with today is though you have to filter the information. There, there's no shortage of information. It's just, can you filter it to get, gain uh, what, it, what is really uh, good? Because every big company is going to have some bad things out there too. There's no way that you can be doing billions of dollars in work and not have somebody uh, not happy. If I teach a class of uh, 100 students, I can't have, everybody's not going to be happy in the class. Uh, you know, if I can have a very high uh, rating that way, then, then I, I, I'm very satisfied with that. But it's, it's the same thing with business, you know, but obviously if you've got 30% of a class that's not happy, that's a high percentage that's not happy, right? Uh, did you have a question, Eloise? Oh, you look like you're about to... Okay. Okay, uh, so... Oops, wrong lecture. Yeah, so I would encourage you to take some looks at, at different uh, missions, uh, uh, visions, core values. It's a really good case, the uh, Merck uh, case. Um, strategic vision versus mission. Uh, sort of, so you can sort of differentiate uh, between the two. And I've more or less said that, who we are, uh, what we do, or where we're going. Markets to, you know, strategic vision. You're, once you've got the higher level vision, like I said, uh, with, uh, you know, best home building brand in North America. Okay, fine. What markets are we going to pursue? Well, I'm probably not pursuing markets in Europe, right? I'm pursuing markets in North America. And then the question is which markets uh, to start with. Uh, future technology, product, customer, uh, focus. Uh, you know, what, what are the, part of your vision might include uh, adoption of, uh, using different uh, technology. You might be looking at uh, BIM, uh, you know, building information modeling and integration of BIM uh, uh, practices with scheduling and with estimating and with engineering, you know, uh, uh, Tecla and different, different programs that are out there and how, how is this organization going to adopt that to leverage where you want to take it. 
Uh, so future technology product customer focus. Kind of company management is trying to create. That, that helps to tie into um, you know, the core value aspect and what you're going to need to do uh, to take it there. Core values, by the way, is something you don't change. You really don't go about, you don't start trying to change core values every three years, right? Um, you really try to develop that and then that becomes really in the heart and soul of people that are working in that, that business. So and fundamentally, core values should be things that are able to easily adapt to changes in technology, changes in operations and that sort of thing. It's just what's at the heart of the organization. If, if you're looking for things that are affected by technology and that, that's really in the vision, right? Which can change. Um, so really, when we're talking about uh, a strategic uh, vision, um, basically there, there's uh, several phases that we go through. And anytime that you, uh, if it's a new strategic vision and you're, you're changing the direction, and again, you might be changing the direction because of changes in the external environment, changes in technology that you have to, you have to do this to survive, or you have to do this to uh, develop a competitive advantage, or this new opportunity has now opened that you need to pursue. So typically, uh, you know, it entails uh, communication. Uh, it should be consistent. So in other words, you don't want to be changing again every five days or every two weeks. If the vision keeps changing, people then just start to not pay any attention to it. Uh, corporations run into a lot of problems when they have, you know, they run into financial difficulties and there's a change at the top, a new leader comes in and they usually take about six months to surmise the, the conditions of the company and then they implement their plan for the future. But then they go after about a year and then somebody else new comes in and then it goes off in a different direction and people start to not respond to that too well. So um, that, that can be, uh, the consistency aspect is important from that, that perspective. So uh, communication, consistency and positive human uh, resource relations, all right, uh, that aspect is reiterating the basis for the new direction. So really what you're trying to do, people do not like change as a general, you know, it's a younger group here, but people that get into a, an organization after a number of years, they get very sort of structured in their ways. And obviously, they can't be as structured as they were 25 years ago, where change was a little bit slower, change is a lot more faster these days, but you'll, you'll find in yourself, mark these words in 15, 20 years from now, some of you will be like, when something changes, like, why is this changing? This, you know, I've got this down and I know this and this, I don't want to see this change. So there's some resistance to that. So obviously, you know, from a uh, management point of view, you have to communicate the logic and reasons behind this change and why this makes sense for this business so that you can get buy-in from the people that are working for you. And so this needs to step down from the different levels of management across the organization so that there's an understanding of why these changes are taking place. If people just think it's change for change sake, uh, they're not going to buy into it uh, as uh, freely. And so, and some people just concern themselves that, you know, this is a new technology that's going to do me out of a job. And quite honestly, for some people it might, all right? Uh, but uh, you want to be um, able to communicate the logic behind the changes and the reasons for it in most cases, it's to uh, make the business more profitable and to sustain the business because in many cases, the business, if it doesn't take, make some of these changes, uh, it will find itself behind the eight ball at some point of view. And people have trouble realizing that in many cases. And sometimes you look at some of the biggest organizations in the world that have failed and you wonder how could this multi-billion dollar organization miss this, right? How could this multi-million dollar, billion dollar organization miss this? How could Kodak miss the digital film sector? They invented it, right? How did they not respond? By the time they responded to it, everybody else had, was already far ahead of them in the market, right? Part of the reason is you're inside. You're not seeing the external environment as clearly as 
competitors might be or newly developed companies might be. Uh, part of it is you've got something that makes you a lot of money right now, currently, mission style, right? Uh, as opposed to vision. And this, this revenue generator, you just can't divert money from that because this is so lucrative. So, you know, you really want to make sure that uh, it's communicated uh, well and that it, 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 we'll talk about the different aspects that affect the business externally, but uh, that it's considered that. Because if you don't do some of these changes, um, I don't, I had the stat at one point, again, uh, when I was in business, we used to do millions of dollars worth of work with Kodak, and they had a huge plant up at Eglinton and Keel Street. Uh, it's a bunch of derelict buildings right now, but worldwide, um, you know, way over 100,000 employees, uh, multi, multi-billion dollar company, and they were Chapter 11 bankruptcy uh, a couple of years ago. I think they're trying to mishmash some sort of coming out of it, but it, they're not the company, even if they do, they're not what they were, obviously engineering oriented uh, at the root of that but being able to expand that from a business point of view uh, not well executed phase two setting objectives so basically um, we have uh, this vision but then basically we, we need to convert the vision into specific performance target we need to break it down all right we need to break it down this is what we want to do and we got to break it down into uh, smaller levels of detail. And so basically, we've got to set objectives. And so we're taking that high level, and then we're saying, OK, so what are the things that we need to do to get that there? I guess my example with uh, uh, best homeowner experience. OK, we got to do this, 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 and breaking that down. So, OK, so then this, then we got to do this, 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 this. So, Again, people that took the project management aspect, it's not much different than a work breakdown structure. You're taking, I want to build this building, I got a substructure, I got a superstructure, I got the building number, I've got all these elements, and then, okay, fine, I got the substructure, what's this? And I got to break that down, I got to break it down further until you have an overall plan to where you want to go. From a business perspective, it's very similar in that respect. Um, it creates yardsticks. So if we've broken it down, then we can start to have mechanisms to measure it, right? So we can break, the, break that down and say, okay, well, within these time frames, we want to have, and this time frame, we want to have this done, all right? And that's going to lead further in the course to where we talk about uh, then, you know, assignments, delegation, uh, feedback, uh, employee reviews, monitoring, tracking, uh, and incentives, right? So that's going to tie into the overall process as well. So setting the objectives and setting challenges. Uh, again, you know, this is where if we can better define it uh, uh, and have uh, challenging achievable objectives, uh, if it's too easy, uh, then you get a little bit complacent with it. If uh, it's not clear, people don't really know what it is that you're trying to do, then there's internal confusion. It's, it's, it, you haven't got a well-defined plan. And um, also, uh, if there's not something that uh, is a little bit stretching or reaching, then you just get what you got last year, probably. Right? There's a lot of people that when they finish uh, school and they start work after a year uh, of work, they've learned most of what they need to know with that particular job. And there's a lot of those people that really don't improve much over the next 10, 15 years because they just keep doing things the same way that they did them. I'm not saying everybody, but there's a good core of people. So as a business, you want to find ways to get your people to stretch and to reach so that they're continuously improving. And so that's not the easiest uh, things to achieve. Well, I think I've talked for long enough <laughs> uh, for a break. Um, why don't we take a 15-minute uh, break, and uh, then we'll start up again, and then I'll have a little discussion towards the end, discussion groups, and we'll go over the uh, assignment, if that's all right with everyone. Does that make sense? Okay.